In the last episode, we found out a little bit about ye old Ginger Spice's life before she became queen. How she loved pizza. A domino factum. Had the hots for a master of the horse. And who, according to legend, was rescued from a raging river after being thrown off her horse by some gallant, handsome hero of the age. It was Edward, a 12-year-old half-brother. There you go, I just told you. Happy? In this episode, we'll learn of Princess Elizabeth's struggles as a young teen. We'll also find out about something else. Alongside her brief spell rocking out in the crib with King Hazza and Annie B. Welcome to the historiographers. Welcome to Past Quirks. Not long after the death of Henry VIII in 1547, Liz had moved into Sudley Castle with her father's widow, her stepmother, Catherine Parr, with Edward Seymour taking over as Lord Protector while her nine-year-old bro bore the tights off anyone who would listen. A teenage Liz and big sis Mary were now back in the line of succession. Previously, the princesses had been pronounced bast, bast, um, illegitimate because of their mothers, but thanks to Cat, Liz's father had changed his will to reinstate them. Now that's what you call ginger power. Cat too had seemed to find matrimonial happiness, swiftly marrying the love of her life, the Lord Protector's brother, Thomas. However, things were not as Tudor rosy as they first appeared. Tom, somewhat jealous of his brother's success in Ed's court, wanted a share in this glory. <laughs> With Cat pregnant, Tom took the opportunity to perv upon the young teen staying in their house. At first, it seemed to be nothing but innocent playfulness. He and Cat would tickle Liz, and on one occasion, Liz's gentlewoman, Catherine Ashley, discovered her mistress's black gown cut into a hundred pieces, later informed by Liz that Cat had held her while my lord did so dress it. Bizarre behaviour. But it didn't stop there. As far back as February 1547, the month after Henry VIII's death, Tom had already asked the 13-year-old for her hand in marriage, which she had politely refused, still considering herself a child. Now that Liz lived with them, however, Tom had begun visiting the 14-year-old in the early mornings. In his nightgown. It is said that if asleep, he would open her bed curtains and jump into bed. As though he would come at her. If awake though, he would simply greet her jovially and deliver a pat on the back. Or on the buttocks familiarly. It is no surprise then that Liz would take to dressing early for the sake of propriety. And yet, her feelings towards Tom, over five centuries later, are still difficult to interpret. As late as the 1580s, Catholic polemical writing was still purporting the view that Queen Liz was an insatiable sexual deviant herself, given her family's incestuous origins. Theologian Rabinus Morris went one step further in declaring of morality that if one sleeps with a woman who sleeps with another man, who sleeps with another woman, who sleeps with me, then whether I will or not, my flesh is inextricably bound up with the flesh of that first man. Well, what can you say? Good luck getting any with an opinion like that, Rab. <laughs> Upon being questioned later on, Cat Ashley recalled how Liz hath spoken to me of him many times. So, on the one hand, filth wizard old enough to be her father trying to get into her petticoats, on the other, a girl getting the attention of an older man and babe magnet at court. Either way, it's pretty gross, let's be honest. Unfortunately for Liz, she didn't seem to have many confidants throughout her childhood, 
aside from Kat Ashley, Blanche Parry and her stepmothers, one of whom was executed for adultery when Liz was just eight in 1542. Furthermore, Liz's aunt Lady Rochford was known to have assisted Catherine Howard in these illicit liaisons with Tommy Culpepper. You couldn't trust anyone, as they seemed to bite off more than they could chew. Door. In this case, Liz was to lose a valuable stepmother and friend in Cat Parr when she and Tom were discovered one day alone in each other's arms where he kissed her in bed. Understandably, Cat was more than a little peeved as she warned Liz of the possible damage inflicted upon her reputation through her conduct to which she was said to have answered little. Soon afterwards, she was made to leave the premises for good. Sadly for Liz, she would be unable to mend this rift with her stepmother as she died in childbirth the same way as Tom's sister had done, giving birth to Prince Ed. In typical dastardly fashion, Tom got in touch with another Tom shortly afterwards. Hey, it's a popular name. Asking Mr. Parry, Whether her great buttocks were grown any less or no? Nothing like being respectful, is there? But Tom was getting desperate now. Whilst trying to woo Liz, he was also bribing her brother with money in an effort to secure a governorship for himself. Should have saved your groat, son. For Tom, it is generally believed, had been planning the abduction of the boy king, whom he would marry off to Lady Jane Grey, whilst himself planning to marry Liz. Luckily for her, though, this villain met his downfall at the hands of his own bro, the Lord Protector, who was forced to execute him on 33 different charges, including attempting to marry a princess without the council's consent, a treasonable offence. For it was on the 16th of January, 1549, that Tom, slightly hammered, made his way towards the king's bedchamber armed with a pistol. The king's spaniel was guarding the bedchamber at the time. Maybe he should have thought this through. Needless to say, after the 20th of March, at least Tom Seymour was saving money on hats. Still, Liz wasn't in the clear just yet. Rumour had it that she was with child following an accusation that her uncle had handled her. My lord, these are shameful slanders, Liz said in her defence, perhaps heeding her stepmother's advice. Sending a letter to Uncle Lord Protector, Liz requested that he issue a proclamation for people not to spread such untruthful rumours, signing off with the words, Written in haste from Hatfield. Hatfield. This 28th. January, your assured friend to my little power, Elizabeth. This little incident aside, Liz was usually considered to be an intelligent child. She could be respectful, as proven at age 12, when presenting her father with a crimson cloth-embroidered copy of Prayers and Meditations, made with her own fair hands in textiles. The book's French, Italian and Latin translations provided by Liz exemplified a meticulous attention to detail. But she could also be cheeky, as witnessed when likening herself within her own personal translation of the miroir or glass of the sinifully soli to... So naughty a sister, that better it is for me to hide such a name. In 1548, her tutor, Roger Asham, told a friend how Her mind has no womanly weakness, and her perseverance is equal to that of a man, and her memory long keeps what it quickly picks up. As clever as a man, what a milestone. And yet it had been just five years since Liz had first received her own private tutor, in the form of William Grindle, a Beowulf enthusiast and scholar fluent in both ancient Greek and Latin. In fact, given Cambridge's position as a Reformation powerhouse at the time, it's no surprise that Henry VIII endorsed the sort of humanist tutors that it produced. Ultimately, some of these men would go on to become advisers to Liz during her own reign. In July 1544, Henry VIII is on his last military campaign in France. And during this time, Catherine Parr, Elizabeth's last stepmother, rules as regent. 
and Elizabeth goes to Hampton Court Palace to stay with Catherine during this time. And she witnesses Catherine ruling as regent, being afforded all the pomp and ceremony of a reigning sovereign, presiding over the Regency Council, signing royal proclamations and approving expenditure on additional troops for the war with France and dealing with the challenge of the ever constant threat from the Scottish border. This undoubtedly would have had a huge impact on Elizabeth seeing a woman ruling and all the men of the council serving her. And it's around this time that she's actually restored to the line of succession along with her sister Mary, but they are not re-legitimised, which of course then allows Edward to change the line of succession when he is king to place Lady Jane Grey on the throne. Cat Parr had been the one responsible for inviting Henry's children into her household to ensure that they were all well educated. French would be taught by Prince Ed's tutor, Jean Belmain, and Latin, after 1548, by Roger Asham. Though there is no evidence that there ever was one. Asham. That is. Oh, okay, I'll. Uh... I'll stop with the jokes. Back to Latin. It didn't only serve as an international icebreaker. Any man of importance could speak Latin, for it was the language of commerce, diplomacy and law. Plus, licentious writers like Ovid had used it as a tool to bring to life all manner of sexual jokes, which was why it was exclusively seen as a reserve of men. Oi, oi. Woe betide Liz when she learned Latin from an early age via textbooks such as William Lilly's. Roger, aside from focusing on the arts in classical antiquity, favoured the double translation method with regards to Latin, where one language would be translated into another and then back again. Featured within that well-old book, The Schoolmaster, Roger promoted the use of praise in place of chastisement for... There is no such whetstone to sharpen a good wit and encourage a will to learning. The influence of his calligraphy could be seen in Lizzie's own handwriting, whereas in his role as Cambridge's public orator, one can imagine the pull Cicero's De Oratori might have had upon Lizzie's inquisitive mind. Perhaps her oratory skills helped her win the people's lover's queen in a time when many considered public speaking an outlandish skill for a woman to have. There is little doubt that Elizabeth was an incredibly skilled orator and very skilled in which she was incredibly clever with her words and this is what kind of her speech is and the way she's able to bring parliament back on side particularly her golden speech towards the end of her reign just goes to show that actually she really was quite an incredible leader unperturbed roger talked his friend johann sturmius through a typical day of education for the princess which started early with the New Testament in Greek, after which she read select orations of Isocrates and the tragedies of Sophocles, which I judged best adapted to supply her tongue with the purest diction, her mind with the most excellent precepts, and her exalted station with a defence against the utmost power of fortune. Remarkable feats for any girl. Tom, see I told you it was a popular name, Rosley, was slightly taken aback when encountering Liz at age six, who, having been informed of the King's blessing, thanked him humbly before inquiring, after his majesty's welfare, that with as great a gravity as she had been 40 years old. And some say that childhood is a carefree time. And it certainly should have been for Liz. Sadly, though, she faced criticism as soon as she escaped from the Temple of Womb, where Greenwich Hospital now stands, was once the site of Greenwich Palace, the place where Liz was born on the 7th of September, 1533, on a Monday. Well, only joking, it was, it was probably a Thursday. Entering into a chamber adorned with tapestries depicting the histories of the Holy Virgin, this iconography would begin her lifelong association with virginity. Unfortunately though, Liz was born a she, meaning that the pageant and jousting that her father had planned for the birth of a son had to be cancelled. Eustace Chapuis, ambassador to Charles the Chin, uh, uh, Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor, spoke rather scathingly of the child born of Catherine of Aragon's usurper Anne Boleyn. 
the king's mistress was delivered of a girl, to the great disappointment and sorrow of the king, of the lady herself, and of others of her party, and to the great shame and confusion of physicians, astrologers, wizards, and witches, all of whom affirmed that it would be a boy. Hang on, wizards? Oh, oh never mind. Amidst the universal disappointments, baby Liz nevertheless bore a striking resemblance to her father, despite the arguments that all newborns resemble miniature psycho-aliens. For Anne, it had been a painful first birth, made all the worse by the fact that it would be the only successful one. For Liz's first royal duty came three days later. She was to be christened. Imagine the scene at the Church of Observant Friars in Greenwich, where... All the walls between the king's place and the friars were hanged with arras, and the way strewed with rushes. Undoubtedly, copping a lot of water in the face, little was Liz to know that this would be the start of her obsession with cleanliness. Contrary to the belief that her monthly bath, whether she needs it or not, is pretty rank to 21st century ears, back then baths tended to have medicinal connotations. Lady Rima Lane, supervising the wet nurse in the bathing of her son, featured within the book The French Garden by Peter Arundel, perhaps sums up Elizabethan family bonding best. Oh, my little heart, God bless thee, rub the crown of his head, wash his ears. Thou art pretty and fat, my little darling, wash his armpits. What aileth his elbow? Oh, what an arm he hath. We don't know how epic Lizzie's arms were. However, she was said to frequent her father's steam bath at Richmond Place, and although greatly perfumed as a queen, was still considered to be very clean. From opting for fresh linen to regularly washing her hands and face, all of her palaces were fitted out with bathing facilities. But for now, Liz would spend her first three months living with her mother in Greenwich Palace before being sent off to form her own household at Hatfield's Old Palace, led by Governess Margaret, Lady Bryan. A short while later, the baby Liz had become something of a bargaining tool for her father. In planning her betrothal to Charles d'Angoulême, third son of Francis I of France, Liz was shown off in a ceremony designed to emphasize the strategic importance of high-born sprogs that to us may seem bizarre. She was introduced, splendidly accoutred and dressed, and in princely state, with all the ceremonial her governess could think of, after which they saw her quite undressed. But were they married? <laughs> of course not. Henry's demands were deemed far too excessive. But this didn't exhaust her list of potential suitors that stretched across Europe to Mordor. Upon reflection, Liz went on to describe how even during Ed's reign, There was offered me a very honourable marriage of two. Give me leave. With his grace's favour, to remain in the estate I was. I persuade unto myself there is not any kind of life comparable unto it. Her second year saw Liz in Henry's embrace as his only legitimate heir in a grand church ceremony, where he and Anne dressed like canaries to celebrate the passing of Henry's ex, Catherine of Aragon. But Anne's good graces with Henry would be short-lived. Alexander Alessius wrote to Liz upon her accession of how he would never Forget the sorrow which I felt when I saw the most serene queen, your most religious mother, carrying you, still a little baby in her arms, and entreating the most serene king, your father, in Greenwich Palace, from the open window of which he was looking into the courtyard. Soon after this event, Anne was arrested on charges of adultery, and her marriage annulled by Thomas Mark IV Cranmer. From this moment on, up until her own accession to the throne 22 years later, that forms the monarch and the woman that Elizabeth becomes. Elizabeth has literally no support network around her. Mary, for example, her first cousin was Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, and in the eyes of Catholic Europe, she is seen as legitimate. 
Elizabeth doesn't have any of this, so she is pretty much friendless and alone and has to navigate her own path from, an, from a young age and learns to keep all her wits about her. Two months after Anne's execution in May of 1536, an Act of Parliament ensured that Liz was excluded and banned to claim, challenge or demand any inheritance as lawful heir. Poor Liz. Nearly a year later, aged three and a half, Liz was at that life stage where she liked to reference herself in the third person, for she supposedly put the question to her governess. How helps it, Governor? Yesterday, my lady princess. And today, but my lady Elizabeth. Fast forward in time to 15th January 1559, though, and we see Liz about to be transformed from a modest, marjoram-infused Protestant of monochrome into a Queen of England. It was the first time that English had been used in the service at Westminster Abbey, which saw Elizabeth crowned in her hair, a symbol of maidenhood and innocence reproduced in marriage services throughout the country. As Queen, Elizabeth now possessed two bodies, her naturally considered lady one and that body politic to govern on loan from God. Yes, she can have two bodies, she's the queen. At the time, the Spanish ambassador Ferrari, Feria, deemed the queen to be a woman of extreme vanity, who was determined to be governed by no one. But perhaps a more suitable assessment of Elizabeth as a princess can be found in her sister Mary's surprising confession to her father my sister Elizabeth is in good health, thanks to our Lord, and such a child toward as I doubt not, but your Highness shall have cause to rejoice of in time coming. We would like to thank our historical consultant for this episode, James Peacock of the Amberlynn Society. I set up the Amberlynn Society in 2014 for the purpose of dispelling many of the myths about Anne Boleyn. The podcast series Talking Tudors has a special called All Things Boleyn, and I'm going to be featuring in the June specials talking about Berlin treasures. You can also listen to other um, podcasts during that time. You can find the Anne Boleyn Society on Facebook and Instagram. Special thanks also to early music middies Elizabethan Instrumental Music 1580 to 1600 and Elizabethan Instrumental Music Thomas Morley's Canzonets 1585 to 1600 and to the Somerset Group fan pages music in the time of Shakespeare by Dirk Frameth. Furthermore, a message of thanks to our narrators and contributors, Graham Collier, Colin Bailey, Ellie McPherson, Michael Farley, and Lisa Hudson. This episode of Past Quirks has been brought to you by the historiographers. If you'd like to find out more, then please join our Facebook group entitled The Historiographers of Facebook. This series has been made through collaborating with some amazing people. Any donations are greatly appreciated. However, if you are unable to donate, then please do share us on social media so that we can continue to share our love for the past with others. Thank you very much.